Yeah, I'm William Nyan. I'm a distinguished professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego. It's an abnormality in the body chemistry. It's caused by mutations in a gene and the gene specifies the formation of an enzyme that's involved in the metabolism of purines. Hypoxanthine, guanine, phosphoribosyl transferase, and because nobody can pronounce that easily, we shorten it to HPRT. The metabolism decides to work overtime, and the formation of these complex purine molecules is made in excess. The end product of that series of chemical reactions is uric acid. Most people with gout have problems excreting uric acid in the urine, so the urine uric acid is low and the blood uric acid is high. These kids are massively overproducing uric acid, so it's high in the blood and it's sky high in the urine. And that causes a lot of trouble. Most of these kids are mentally retarded. They're not all, some have graduated from high school. Their degree of physical disability is way out of proportion to their intellectual performance. He's um, in bed and he's propped up by pillows. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to assume this sitting posture. None of these kids has ever walked. They can't even sit in a chair without being supported. The standard picture of one of our kids is in a wheelchair and his arms are bound to the arms of the wheelchair and the legs are bound. These children, unaccountably do whatever it takes to inflict injury on themselves, the variety of which is limited only by his imagination. Almost anything you could imagine that these kids would do to hurt themselves, they do. And so kids who aren't restrained or whose teeth haven't been removed end up with loss of tissues. We've had kids that have lost fingers, we've had kids that have bitten off their tongues. The hallmark of the disease is loss of tissue around the lips. Much of his upper lip and the soft palate and it's not that they don't feel pain, they feel pain the way you and I do, and they hate to do these things, but nevertheless, they're driven to do it. This is some kind of a consequence of the abnormal gene. He was having failure to thrive, wasn't gaining any weight, wasn't doing much of anything. And he was eating fine. He was just so spastic. The things he was doing were very, very typical for a kid with cerebral palsy because he didn't have control over his body. He kept having these orange sand crystals in his diaper. You know, if it wasn't in your kid's diaper, you'd look at it and say, oh, that, that kind of looks really pretty. He fell out of the car seat, and I went to pick him up, and he was just screaming uncontrollably. I didn't know what was wrong with him. And he had these bruises all over his arms that looked like bite marks. We put gloves on his hands. There were days he didn't have to wear his gloves. And one of those days in particular, I remember I was making some tater tots and I had bring them to the table on the pan and he reached out and he grabbed the hot pan with his hands. And 
I laid my leg across his arm so he couldn't get his arm to his mouth. And as soon as I took the glove off my hand, he chewed through the glove. I just started screaming and bawling. His thumb was completely black. It was mutilated. You could see the bone. They feel the pain. They know they're doing it, and they want to be stopped. There was no information. There was just not really anything. When we first discovered this disease, the truth was most patients died of renal failure before they were two years old. Back when I first moved to California, I was looking around for where would we find these kids, and there were some in all of the institutions for the retarded. In those days, those institutions were flourishing, and they aren't anymore. You'd go into a ward with about 20 or 30 kids, and the one that everybody loved <laughs> was the last night kid. One of the things that I love about this picture is those bright eyes. He's obviously relating to somebody in the room. These are also unusually lovable kids. Yeah, it's a happy look. He's smiling, yes. He um, was given a key to the city by the mayor of Miami. He had a beautiful white set of teeth. I mean, they were gorgeous. I started calling dentist after dentist after dentist to get these teeth removed. They all thought I was nuts. There's nothing wrong with his teeth. They're perfect. They're beautiful. Why would you want to remove them? Look at his finger. This is what he did with them. It's very difficult to get a dentist to take the teeth out. I was a neurologist at Cleveland Clinic, sent me into a step in Cleveland, and he literally looked at me and said, well, if you wouldn't be such a lazy bitch, you wouldn't be doing this. So three weeks after he almost bit his thumb off, they actually got me into somebody and they pulled his teeth and he was like a different child. So a family in which they've had more than one kid with this disease usually removes the teeth as soon as they appear. The first of the patients was a little boy who turned up in the emergency room of the Johns Hopkins Hospital because he had blood in the urine. They looked at the urine under the microscope of this kid. It was loaded with crystals. They thought they were for sure cysteine crystals. And so they admitted the kid to the hospital, and the next morning they came up to my lab. The amino acids of the urine were perfectly normal, and the boy had hyperuricemia. We went to see the patient, and there he was with all the things that we've just been talking about, the spasticity and the mental retardation and the abnormal behavior. Um, he, he was wearing big cotton things that looked like boxing gloves to keep him from biting his fingers. And when we took the things off one hand with one of us available to catch him before he put the hand in the mouth. In inherited diseases of metabolism, the abnormality begins with the DNA because the DNA is what creates the RNA, which then creates the protein that in the course of metabolic disease doesn't work properly. The disease is coded for by genes on the X chromosome, by a gene on the X chromosome. A male has a 50% chance of having the disease. It's fairly common in families that have a lot of kids uh, to have more than one. When we first described this disease, there was no treatment. Most of these kids died before they were a couple of years old. Once allopurinol was discovered, it became possible for us to keep these people from having high uric acids. That keeps them from destroying their kidneys. The management is still a little difficult because xanthine 
which accumulates behind the metabolic block that allopurinol causes is itself capable of making stones, but it doesn't cause the destruction of the, of the kidneys. Daniel was born on December 1st, and I just turned my head like, oh no. Here we go again. I went to lay him on the couch to change his diaper, and there was the orange sand. Our Keith was hypertone, or he was so spastic. Daniel was more low tone and just sloppy. There's the knuckle below your fingernail and then there's the next knuckle. He would take his finger and he would shove it in his eye that far. So he sees Daniel doing this. Well, if he can do it, I can do it better. So I'll start scratching my eye. I've been consulted with people, particularly in institutions where the rule of the institution was that you could not use restraint. I've often solved that by writing a letter to whoever runs the institution. This rule ought to be broken for people with this disorder. If they got out of their protective devices, they would fall to the floor, they would bang their heads, they would bang their bodies on the railing of the bed. Daniel had behaviors, but not like Keith. The feeding of a Leshnayan patient is often quite variable. I mean, some of them eat pretty much the way you and I do, except that somebody has to hold the spoon, otherwise they'd be biting their fingers. And others are very difficult to feed, and some have fed with a tube in the stomach, and I don't recommend that at all. Almost anything you do to invade the body of these kids, they will find ways of making damage out of it. Uh, we had a patient at the San Diego Naval Hospital that um, had a tube in his stomach through the skin of the abdomen, and he kept pulling it out and they kept putting it back in, and sooner or later he got peritonitis and died. They all get dislocated hips because of the abnormal muscle pull. I tell people not to do anything about that because if they're not going to walk around, who cares if they're dislocated? But anyway, this one had a whole bunch of hardware put in, and then with the abnormal muscle pull, it came out of the socket and out of the skin. And I don't recommend any of that kind of hardware either. Richard Preston wrote a wonderful article in The New Yorker about it. He went to visit a couple of my adult patients, neither of which I'd ever seen. Exceptions to the rule in the sense that they were adults, I think, before allopurinol was discovered. One of these guys is smart enough to realize that his language is bound to offend a lot of people. He's built a little sign that he keeps in his pocket, and he says he has this disease that makes me insult people and so forth, and please forgive me, or something like that. He lives in a group house in Santa Cruz, and I got him to come to San Diego and be part of a study we were doing, a new thing that had come along that somebody thought was going to change the behavior in this disease, and it didn't. When I asked him after he got through the treatment what he thought it had done for him, he said, it didn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 
Not only did they find these physical ways to hurt themselves, they started mentally hurting themselves, especially Keith. He would scream, he'd hit you, he'd call you names, he would do everything in the book, pretty much to piss you off. He would have such good days, I love you, mommy, I love you so much, and then it was, I hate you. Or he would sit in his wheelchair and, mom, 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 and we're talking like this would go on for six hours. I do not think it's attention-seeking behavior. I think it's driven behavior. The best way of handling any of these things are to ignore them. Even the self-injurious behavior can stop if it doesn't get any reaction. But of course, they can also bite off a finger while you're ignoring it. <laughs> The neurological and the behavioral features of disease have been so far completely resistant to all our efforts at, at treatment. So we can keep them alive and keep them from developing gout, but we can't alter the neurology and we can't alter the behavior. I thought when we first discovered this disease that we were going to find an answer to the connection between the abnormal enzyme and the abnormal behavior and we would have a way to influence behavior. Well, this turned out to be a tougher nut than that. As a physician, I think my business is to do everything I can to make people as healthy as I can and to keep them alive as well as I can. The concept of euthanasia has never entered my head. Most people do seem to want to live despite their disabilities and I like to do everything I can to make them as happy as I can. If I were practicing in Oregon and somebody asked me to do euthanasia, which is legal there, I just wouldn't do it. This is, as you point out, a terrible disease. On the other hand, I also pointed out that these are unusually engaging kids, and most of them seem to be pretty comfortable with their status in life. But it's not always true. I'm still actively doing anything I can think of about this disease. If we got a bright idea as to what to do about the behavior, we would obviously explore it. We've gone down a number of blind alleys before. There have been a number of autopsies of patients who've died of the disease. And you look at the brain under the microscope and it looks absolutely normal. If one could find out what is the connection between this clear-cut abnormality and purine metabolism and all these things that go on with the brain and the nervous system, then we could fix it. And it's my hope that sooner or later, there'll be a way.